My name is Kai McIntyre and I'm a second year here at the university studying marketing at the David Eccles School of Business. I'm excited for this opportunity to be involved in today's sales summit, but even more excited to introduce our speaker, Tony Watson. Tony is a COO at Zenicor and has spent the last 30 years in marketing and sales leadership roles, primarily in the medical device industry. His strong suits are in the sales process and execution, as well as building, developing, and leading high performance teams. Please join me in welcoming Tony Watson. Well, I was going to say exactly everything Scott said, um, so I'm going to have to come up with a whole new talk on the fly. Um, tough act to follow. That was an awesome, awesome start to the day. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, didn't look that closely at who was presenting, and I was pleasantly surprised <laughs> to see that's who it was. Um, so I'm just going to go to the uh, quick background on what we're going to do here. Background on me, um, I'm going to go through a few things. There is so much we could cover that if you feel like I'm going too fast, don't worry. There's a few slides that are really just kind of informational reminders for you guys as you start to get ready for interviews. Um, so don't sweat it and scribble everything. Just kind of, I'm here, you're here. Let's just kind of engage with each other. Um, so don't worry too much about that. We will make sure my slides get sent out. So if, if you feel like I'm rushing anything, it's only because there's just too much to cover. <laughs> so we'll dive in here. Um, <clears throat> as Kai mentioned, some of the background on me, I'm going to dig in just a little more because it was a bit of a journey like Scott, um, and that's the part to really um, plan for. When we get into like why sales and, and why are you here, why do you want to do this, um, that's going to change over time. What you do is going to change over time, and having the, really the journey in mind versus the destination is important. So I, I do want to talk about that a little bit. So my first sales job was at Sears, which doesn't hardly exist anymore. Um, but I was selling commission. Um, it was actually a job that today still would be considered decent pay for a college job. It's pretty, pretty amazing. But I sold lawn tractors and snow blowers, and you wait for the customers to come to you. And that's a different mindset than a lot of professional sales where you got to go out and find business. You got to reach out to people, cold call. Um, but you learn the basics. And uh, that helped me a lot, but I knew I wanted to be in more control of my own destiny. So I pursued a career in sales right out of college. And then that got really hard. And uh, having to pick up the phone, get hung up on. I worked for DHL, which some of you may know of, but it was Airborne Express at the time, even lesser known, competing against FedEx and UPS. So you got to, you know, I'm already small and I was a football player. So you can imagine being the smallest, smallest in an industry of two behemoths and us as the distant third. Uh, I came with that kind of aggressive Tom Brady type chip on my shoulder and just went after it every day and learned a lot, failed fast failed a lot. <laughs> um, but then that led me to, because I engaged, because I was committed to the process and dug in, like Scott said, um, I was able to get into med device sales, which is like, it was like a two, two level leap or three level leap from a lot of my friends and people I knew in the industry. I was able to double my income in one year um, and doubled it again the next year. So it was like a massive pivot and, and improvement uh, in opportunity, but also just the learning. I was able to be in the operating room. I've been in over 5,000 surgeries uh, in my career as a rep and as a manager and leader. Um, and that being close to patient care was totally different than like just a transactional sale, uh, which is where many of us have to start. Um, you don't always get to have the most fun doing it. It's hard and you got to cut your teeth somewhere. And it's not always this beautiful thing where you, you get to see a patient get better because you were there. Um, but I got to do that for a long time. And now I'm selling the vision of a company that can do that. I lead the company. It says COO, but I actually, uh, as of a few weeks ago, became acting CEO. Um, so we kind of shrunk the company, and, and that benefited me in the sense of title. Uh, but I have a lot more responsibility with a smaller team. Um, but we really are selling a vision. Fundraising is the same thing as selling. Uh, so I do fundraising, and I do all the selling right now until we hire uh, more of a team uh, next year. So. And then I've done things along the way. I have my own uh, side business in uh, outdoor gear and apparel, and uh, I do consulting on the side, and I've done some real estate. That's helped because then it's all on your shoulders. That's what got me ready for entrepreneurship, uh, but also sales is very entrepreneurial in general. So having your, your hands in more than one pot sometimes is OK, as long as you're not stretching yourself too thin and you're able to stay focused. So we're going to do a few things. It's going to be a long day, I'm sure, exciting day, but I want to get you guys involved. So you know, why? why? Why do you want to be in sales? I'd love to hear from one or two people if you have like a, a, a theory or a, you know, if you haven't done it yet, you don't know. But uh, does anybody want to be brave and tell me why you want to be in sales? Go ahead. For me, at least, uh, I've, saw, I've seen my, both my mom and dad kind of work their way through sales careers my whole life. 
And uh, so I'm like, something that resonated with me that my dad told me from a young age is sales is really like feast or famine. Um, if you perform well, you'll do well. You'll get the money that you earn, basically. Um, and I always kind of do well with my back against the wall, so that's kind of what I've always liked about it. It's kind of puts me on the spot. Yeah. That's very true. There's nowhere to hide. There's a lot of corporate jobs where you can kind of float along and, and two people might perform wildly different and their career paths don't end up being wildly different. Uh, sales, that, that's not how it's going to go. Um, so just understanding your why. Some of these are going to be prompts I'm putting up just to remind you to think of these things because the guy in the picture there, um, you know, some people think sales because they want to make a good living, right? And that's very possible. But if that's the only motivation, you might get lost in the shuffle and you may not really you know, dig in and, and, and do what you need to do to be successful. Uh, because feast and feast or famine, <laughs> as he said, you know, the variability in risk, comfortable getting uncomfortable, um, that's something I would highly suggest you embrace as a practice. Find a way, put yourself in uncomfortable situations. Um, like when I was first becoming a manager, one of the exercises we had to do uh, in a training I did was when we go to dinner, we had to pull the server aside and give them feedback, direct feedback, good and bad on what they did and just tell this person who did not ask and give them our feedback. And as a sales manager, as an example, you have to do that. And so it's great to just practice that and put yourself in uncomfortable situations. Um, this is one I'd love to do a quick show of hands. If you, in, you can define it your own way. There's a lot of ways to say this. But have you worked at a job truly independently before? Show of hands. OK, pretty good. So only about 5% of people can do that successfully for the long term. Meaning you're going to get up out of bed at 5 in the morning like I do every day, go to the gym, read the Wall Street Journal, get to work. No one's ever told me to do that. I just do it every day. Very few people do that kind of stuff. Um, so set yourselves apart. Set those good habits because you can do it. It's just very few people commit to doing it. So keep that in mind. You've got to own it. Um, this one's kind of a joke, a little bit fun, but you'll hear these terms in sales interviews. You may just hear it in some of your classes. You know, hunting versus farming, slightly different mindset. Um, so this one I'd kind of like to do a show of hands. Um, are you a hunter? you have any idea? Farmer or Uber Eats? <laughs> okay, some of you are neither, and that's okay. Or you're more than one, right? Chances are you're more than one, and you might lean one way or the other. I lean towards hunting, but I farm. And what I mean by that, if you haven't heard those terms, <clears throat> going out and eating what you kill, getting the business, breaking new ground, forming new relationships. Farmers are maintaining accounts, maybe cross-selling, upselling, but not necessarily really breaking down those barriers. So that's something to just keep in mind. There's different jobs you might interview for. Some are looking for pure hunting. If that's not your bag, make sure you know that about yourself. So just think about those things to set yourself up for success. And the Uber Eats is more of a joke, but also um, something to keep in mind. If you do see yourself as a good delegator, Maybe you need to get enough sales experience to then become a great leader and manager and just kind of keep that in mind. So this is two other things. And now I do want to see everyone's hands because you got to pick one. Um, do you anticipate and proactively solve problems or do you react well under pressure? So let's go with the first one. Who sees where the puck is going and skates to it as a form or habit? OK, good. And how about reacting well under pressure? I know what you're going to say. <laughs> exactly. So. You're probably a bit of both, right? But also think about that, because some sales jobs are going to be structured, where you got to be very strategic, very forward-looking, very planful. Some are just boom, 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 hit the phones, go, 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 do your video calls like 20 a day, 100 a day, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, and so you got to kind of balance that, keep that in mind, and know, know yourself. Um, so this is important when we get to the brag book, but I list them here because I, I want to talk about this in case we run out of time. This is one of the most important things. If you don't have at least a few of these things already under your belt, Go find them, start getting them, engage, whatever it is. So I don't care what the competition was, but if it was your fourth grade spelling bee, that's probably not relevant. But um, high school on, anything you're winning at, anything you're doing well at, uh, philanthropy, volunteering, uh, leadership positions, start to compile those things and have a really good list to set yourself apart because you're going to be competing for jobs with each other, but people from BYU, and you definitely want to beat them, uh, and from other, other places, and they're going to have a lot of this stuff too. And so really make sure that you are documenting that so we can put it in the brag book uh, that we'll talk about in just a second. Um, so interview prep, uh, the first line is the most important one that I'll hone in on because this is a great sales practice too, is valid business reason or VBR. When you start the meeting, take control as much as you can. Now you've got to be respectful as the person's kicking off the interview, of course, 
But if they say, tell me about yourself or walk me through your resume, the tendency is to just do that. And that's fine, but I think you're missing an opportunity to take some command and show that you can run a meeting. And so what I always do in those situations is say, we're sitting here today because um, I'm interested in your company because I saw this and I think I can make a difference because of this, this, and this in my experience. And then you can get to the nuts and bolts of your, your chronological walkthrough of your resume. But I think it's really important to state that and in sales too. Sometimes people take the meeting because someone else told them to take the meeting. And they're sitting down with you and they're like, who are you? Why do we have this, this meeting? Are you some sales guy? And then you have to say, here's why we're here. I spoke with your CFO. We can save you a million dollars this year. Here's how. Let's dig in. So you got to have something. It doesn't have to be significant in length, but make sure you're clearly establishing why you're there. Um, and I'm just going to keep going on this one, except the last one, LinkedIn profile. If you're not active on there now uh, or using it every day, make sure you are truly up to date. I'm sure your classes and teachers, everyone's telling you that, but in career services, of course, who's here, uh, make sure they're telling you that. Or I'm sure they're telling you that, but make sure you're doing it. Um, this is typical sales process or sales funnels um, and what they might look like, and they're kind of different names. And you can see the process, what you're doing as an individual overlaps and is generally the same, but different terminology as a sales pipeline. Um, but really what to keep in mind there is that you're already doing this every day in one form or another. Dating is a great example. Uh, if you look at identify and qualify, um, you're, you're meeting more than one person online or wherever at school, and then you go on a date, maybe a few first dates. You narrow it down, you narrow it down. It's kind of the same thing if you really think about it. And a lot of that uh, nuts and bolts happens in the uh, you know, influence buying and the, the presentation or the demo, if you will, uh, phase. Uh, but nonetheless, you have to have enough things going on to then have enough face-to-face -face meetings to know I like this person or I like this job or this person's going to buy my product. So they all kind of relate. So the reason I bring that up is if you're not already thinking in a process like this day to day, start doing it. Like look at, I have 20 things to tackle, I'm going to narrow down what's most important. Uh, when you're interviewing, don't apply to 20 jobs just to apply to 20 jobs. Apply to the five that are most interesting to you, and then you're going to likely narrow it down to the ones you really want and put everything you got into those. Um, that's just my advice. There, some people might say interview for everything you can find, but I would say find things you're really excited about and, and try to kind of narrow it down, follow that same kind of process. Like, is this a job I could get? Is this a job I actually want? And then whittle it down. So it's just important to keep thinking that way. Um, brag book, uh, this is a nice thing to have. I don't know what is most common these days coming right out of school, but what I always had was like a three ring binder um, and stuff ready, like every certificate, everything I ever won, every accolade, um, anything I could document, sales reports, uh, anything that showed performance grades, dean's list, have that stuff printed off. A digital version's great, they can email it after, but it's really nice if you get a chance to present in a meeting. You're not going to be able to do that well. Like if you bring your iPad, you're like standing at the desk and trying to go through your iPad and be like, look what all the stuff I won. Um, but it's nice to have it ready. You don't get to use it much, but you got to have it. <laughs> I hate to say it. So it might sound futile, but I would highly suggest having something like that ready, uh, at least to send after. But I would recommend even printing and uh, you know, having a three ring binder. Oh, and I like this statement. Best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, and the second best time is now. So if you haven't started this kind of process, that, that's uh, one of the homework uh, recommendations I have for you. Um, territory plan, this is great. If you get to the second interview, you've hit it off, you've connected, um, you found a person you like, a job you like, the manager, you're getting along, they say, okay, come back. And you've already asked a few questions about the territory, but you don't know everything you need to know, right? It's one interview. But you're going to need to come back and often show them that you are ready to jump in. And that should be formatted in a 30, 60, 90 day plan, kind of a breakout can't have a two-year plan. You don't know enough to have a two-year plan. And anything less than that's probably too little. So in those first 30 days, um, I'd like to hear from the audience, see if anybody has any idea. What do you think you probably should do in the first 30 days, taking over a territory that someone left recently? Go ahead. Meeting with like former clients and current clients that are part of the territory that you Exactly. So. Oftentimes, once you've done one of these, and you could do it now for a hypothetical company selling widgets, um, get an idea of how you would tackle it. That's an obvious one, right? And a good answer, but it is somewhat obvious, and so is a lot of this if you think about it. Getting the specifics woven into it, that's up to you to ask good questions. That shows you're ready to be a salesperson if you're asking good questions. So 
that's where you fill in the blanks. But having a template kind of like, I'm gonna meet with current customers, find out what went wrong with ones we lost if we don't have them anymore, uh, and then in the next phase, typically starting to assess where's the rest of the opportunity. And then within, the, within that 90 day window is the execution, really getting after it, having a plan, and showing how you're gonna go about that. It may not be right. You're not gonna know everything you need to know, um, but showing that you have a process in mind and a plan for it is really important. Um, so we're going to actually do that here a little bit uh, together, a little bit more. So, but the big thing is that this cuts through you understanding the value that the company brings or not. Um, so if they're um, a low cost player and you know that, then you say, okay, I'm going to find the most cost conscious, biggest customers where my impact can be millions of dollars instead of tens of dollars and they're going to want to talk to me because I can save them millions of dollars. If we have the coolest, best new thing that solves a certain problem, we're going to find who those best prospects are. But you got to understand that. If you're getting to the second and third interview, you need to know where the value is. What's the differentiator? Why is this company great? Why do you want to work there? Um, so here's the situation. Um, you're taking over a territory. you got to grow it by X percent. Let's just say you need to be at 10 percent above plan, so 110 percent, we'll call it. Um, it was the top region last year. Great rep, long time rep. They left, and now the territory's in the basement. It's one of the worst performing ones. So you're, it's an opportunity, in a sense, to take it back up. I love those. I love the turnarounds when it comes to taking on a sales territory or region, but um, it's also a watch out. You got to find out why. So that's really important. Um, so I would like to ask you know where you would prioritize and see what you think here. You know the first accounts you go to are probably your current accounts, like I mentioned. But what kind of things would you want to ask is probably a better way to say that. Not where would you prioritize, but what questions would you want to ask? If you're like, okay, I know the territory's down. I know I need to grow it. What else do I need to ask in the interview? Anybody have any thoughts? I can spoon feed you, but I'm sure you know this, even if you haven't done it. Go ahead. How are we delivering value to our current clients? Like why do they keep um, coming to us for, for services? That's right. You don't have to wait till you can ask the customer, ask the person you're interviewing with, right? They, they know that. Uh, and conversely, why are we down? Why are we losing the business? I know I put it in here in general, but really understanding that was it the the rep had a good relationship, um, and they don't they you know uh, they like the other guy better from the other company. Is the other company way ahead in tech? Are you falling behind? There's a bunch of things you could learn that tell you also. Do you even want this job? Sometimes when territory's way down, it might be staying down for a, for a very good business reason that you can't fix yourself, especially as a first time salesperson. So make sure you're really understanding what you're getting into because um, it's a mixed bag out there. There's tons of great jobs in sales. I highly recommend it for those of you who are still on the fence. It's a great way to learn business skills that really apply to a lot of other things, as Scott was saying, not just relationship building and kind of convincing people of things, but just the general way that business is looked at. You tend to think more um, proactively. You tend to think more uh, within the parameters of how business is conducted. And so even if you do it for just a few years, you're going to be generally better off than someone who went straight into many other roles that, that a lot of your peers are looking at. So something to think about. Again, I think this can be a takeaway is just like as you get into interviews and you start um, talking to folks, really think about, okay, how would I tackle this? What do I need to know in order to tackle it? Um, so tips and tricks. Interviewing, I mentioned already, is, is, uh, and like fundraising that I'm doing now, is it's a sales process meaning you're going to have more prospects than you're actually going to actually close. So you need more prospects than one, <laughs> typically. Uh, I've batted 1,000 on a few opportunities in the past, but that's pretty, pretty rare. Um, and then don't ask any questions that you could answer yourself. Um, don't come to the interview and be like, hey, I have some questions I prepared. And if it would have taken you five minutes to do it on Google, that's, that's a big ding. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> Prepare on your own uh, and go beyond that, like right? leverage your network, LinkedIn, reach out, meet someone at the company ahead of time if you can. Um, the always be closing is an important one, and that's not what people think. It's not, can I have the job? You ask another question, can I have the job? You're not closing, closing necessarily, but it's a check-in. It's, does that answer your question? Yes. Get them saying yes. Okay. Did, um, you know, can I ask you a question? Yes. <laughs> Anything that gets them saying yes over and over is really good. It kind of sets up that pattern when you're selling or interviewing. Um, but also in the sense of just checking in and making sure that you're really on track. And an important one, they'll almost never give it to you in the first interview, but if you say, is there anything that would stop you from moving me forward in the process? 
And if they say, well, I have questions about X, then you get a chance to do that and, and answer that question instead of them just throwing you in the wrong pile. Um, so make sure you're always checking in one way or another. Um, and we're at 10 minutes, so this was the one slide I was going to breeze through anyways. Uh, homework, these are just some suggestions, things to work on um, for preparation. And again, you'll have these slides. So you don't have to necessarily write all this down, but feel free to take a picture if you'd like as well. And I'd like to jump to discussion and questions because I have said a lot. <laughs> what do you guys got? And anything's on the table. You can ask about, you know, <clears throat> my experience about med device, about running a startup, um, anything like that. Okay, working in medical sales, a lot of times you're talking to doctors who don't want to give you the time of day. What's your best tip for getting in there and like actually having them listen to you? Good question. So early on, what I leveraged a lot was wanting to learn, um, and uh, and that benefited me in multiple ways because they actually helped me learn. They let me come into their procedure and just observe. So if I had a surgeon who was using all competitive products, and I used to have a whole portfolio of products that was in a duopoly, basically. So a lot of times they used a little bit of both companies, but almost all one or the other, typically. And I'd be like, I just want to see how you work and see if there's anything you know, I can offer of value and, and just learn. And they would often be more open to that in, that in that kind of setting. Not every job works that way, but in uh, med device, that's usually the best tactic. And you need to genuinely want to learn. So come prepared. Don't, I made the mistake of asking a question I could have Googled, which is why I put that on there. One of the toughest surgeons I ever worked with, he grew up as a juvenile delinquent and been arrested like 30 times in his life and then cleaned up his act and became one of the best surgeons in the world. He's covered in tattoos, he's ripped, he looks like James Bond. He's very intimidating, very military. And I asked him a question I could have, asked, you know, just to ask a question. And I could have looked it up. And he's like, why can't you, and he said the F word, he's like, why can't you F and Google that? And I was like, you're right. <laughs> I was like, dumb, dumb thing to ask. But I was trying to engage. But show that you know your stuff as much as you can know, then ask a good question. Um, that really helps a lot, helps build a relationship. And I'm friends with him now, but I, I didn't do so well that day. <laughs> Yes, in the back. <clears throat> One sec, we'll bring in the mic. Um, part of your journey, and I, I saw this with Scott as well, is in developing relationships and to order to sell yourself and kind of create more of a wide net of who you are um, with networking. What are some tips that you would have or suggestions for someone that isn't part of the industry, doesn't know anybody in the industry to get started in that networking process? Yeah, great, great question. So like I just started to reach out to Scott actually on LinkedIn because I want to connect with him. So I'll give that as one example is being very specific. You might know this, but not everybody does it very well. If you're going to send a request to somebody you don't know, absolutely put a very personal message in there. And people will often respond. They get a lot of marketing. LinkedIn has gotten nuts with marketing, so it's hard to cut through that. Um, but if you have a secondary connection, ask that person, how well do you know so-and-so? So it takes a little digging. That's a real important way. But another one is I'll say, you know, in sports and in business life, game knows game. If you're working your butt off, you're putting yourself out there, you're doing things like, you know, being at these kinds of events, speaking, having a part of something, Anything that shows your talents and gives you a chance to showcase that uh, is important to do. And then just keep honing your craft, working at it, practicing mock interviews, mock you know, sales competitions, anything that, that gets you that exposure. Because then people like, like me who will be hiring next year, a uh, number of people, I already know who that person is. Um, but if they have never heard of you and have no reason to have, um, that's a challenge, and I think, uh, but not insurmountable. I think just reaching out, showing that you can be a salesperson, I think is important. Um, so LinkedIn, phone calls, call a company. If, if you know you want to work at a certain company, call and say, can I talk to someone in sales? They'll always forward you to the salesperson. They, they won't screen that call. So you can say, can I talk to someone in sales? And then say, hey, I'm looking to get into the industry. I'm fresh out of school. What do you need to see from me so that I can get an interview either soon or, or down the line? What other jobs you know, should I look at as kind of a stepping stone if that's required? Um, that's a great way, too. Up here. Uh, oh, there you are. <laughs> I can hear you just fine, but they need to record it. <laughs> um, I was just curious, how do you guys stay up to date with your technology because each company is driving for something different? How do you do what with technology? Sorry. Uh, keep up to date. Oh, keep up to date. Yeah, so in med device specifically, you know, it's a big investment, big commitment, long timelines, right? You got FDA clearance, testing, all kinds of things to be uh, thinking about. 
Um, luckily, I'm at a startup where R&D is 85% of spend. The big companies, they get so big and then they cut it down to like five and less and less to try to make a number. Luckily, we're not a public company and we will be bought by a public company someday uh, if we're successful, so I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> so it's really about committing resources um, and that's why big companies buy small companies in MedDevice in particular uh, is because they don't innovate well because they don't spend money on it. Um, but keeping up, I'd say the most important thing, and I just did a LinkedIn post on this last week, is engaging with customers. Um, so I was at Mayo Clinic Jacksonville last week showing a 3D printed version of our device to a thoracic surgeon. He gave us a couple ideas that we're gonna actually put into the device, but also validated that most of everything we're doing is on the right track. So if you're not engaged with customers, you're probably not solving a problem that they want solved. You're, you're inventing a product that makes some sense, but is there a market for it? Does anybody actually want it? So engaging with customers early and often is probably the most important thing. Again, sales comes in handy. That's why I'm acting CEO of my company. The previous person did not have any customer facing experience. I have mostly customer facing and that's critical to product development. Uh, yeah, right up here. <clears throat> I know sales for the medical device industry is becoming more competitive. Is something that I want to go into as well. What do you recommend for students or like people in college right now to do if they want to go into that industry? Yeah, there's a couple, um, and good question, because it is hard to break in. Uh, the biggest companies, uh, Stryker, Medtronic, uh, I think Boston Scientific has it too. A lot of them have a fresh out of college program, uh, like associate sales rep, where you kind of support a team of reps or a really busy individual uh, rep or manager, and you get a chance to kind of learn a bunch. You run around with your head cut off in you know, trays of instruments or disposable devices, and you're going all over the place wherever they need you, but you get to learn a ton, and that's the best way in early on, at least at the big companies. Um, the other things you can do is there's a thing called medical sales college. It's okay, I've heard mixed reviews, but it's out of Colorado. I think it's somewhat remote. You can probably do a lot of it without going there, but they help you get kind of set up with the basics, like how to get into a hospital and get the approvals you need to just walk in the door. You have to have like your second born kid and, and uh, all your vaccines and all your records back to elementary school to go into a hospital as a vendor. So they help you with some of that nuts and bolts. Um, but also you can email me my, my contacts on the next slide. Um, you can email me, uh, a good friend of mine actually started, he was my boss early on in MedDevice, he started a training program specifically to address that. And they're also a recruiter, so they help place people coming out of college, they give them all the, the things they need clinically and operationally to be good salespeople that they didn't already have, and then they help them get a job as well. So it's a really good, good organization and a great option. <clears throat> in the back here, if you see here. <clears throat> And I think that might be our last one. How are we on time? Okay, two minutes. Maybe one more after that. <clears throat> is there much opportunity for medical sales in Utah? Because I've heard that it's not very big and you have to branch out more, but is there opportunity for that if we want to stay local? There is. It's, um, you know, it's considered you know, flyover country in some people's worlds, even though we have tons of health care and a very big growing population that's changing. Um, but ultimately, if you were starting a business like I am, essentially, we're starting a new commercial entity. We, we've been in business mostly developing products. When I hire people, I won't be hiring anybody here, and it's not just because I'm here. It's because there's other healthcare markets that are, are better. So if it's a young company, you're gonna tend to see them commit to places like Minnesota, because uh, there's a ton of med device there. It's a big growing space, but then otherwise it's kind of the coasts. Uh, you tend to see Texas and Florida as the two biggest, and California. But as a young company, you usually avoid California because it's a pain to do business there. Uh, but there, is, there are jobs here, absolutely. Just the bigger companies would be the better options where you'll find it. All right, one more minute. We can do one more quick question. Otherwise, feel free to contact me. Any of you, um, honestly, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to, to help out, make connections anywhere I can. You can scour my LinkedIn if I have a connection you need. Um, you know, start there, but do it, do it with others in your network too. I think that can really help you break down some of these, you know, initial walls. All right, that's it. Thank All you right. very much. All right, one more round of applause for Tony. Thanks, guys.